Right, it's 11 o'clock, so um, I think we'll begin. Um, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for attending this latest in our uh, series of webinars. Um, this uh, webinar is in the Back to Basics series, and uh, what Susanna and I are going to be covering is uh, limitation in relation to personal injury claims. Um, and um, just a, a few points about the way we're going to run this. Um, our aim here is to really give you a knowledge of the basic legal framework, which is applicable um, to limitation in the context of PI work. We're not obviously going to be covering other areas of law. Um, if you have questions, it would be helpful if you could please type those in using the question and answer, the Q&A uh, tab. Um, that's a clip there of, of, of where you can find that. If you go to, uh, it's either the top or the bottom of the screen, depending on your setup. Uh, but if you go there and uh, click on that, you'll be able to pose a question to us. And uh, uh, Susanna will look, be looking at those while I'm speaking and uh, the other way around. And we'll endeavour to answer some of those live as we progress. Uh, and we'll look perhaps at some of those at the end if time permits. Uh, so please put those there rather than in the chat because otherwise they might get missed. Uh, any questions we will also add to the um, uh, to the PowerPoint presentations afterwards, which, which will then be made available online for you to read at your leisure. And we will, as I say, we'll make those slides available on our website as soon as we can after this finishes. So uh, topics we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to uh, look at uh, when the special limitation regime for PI claims actually applies and when it doesn't. Uh, also then go on to look at the way time runs uh, and then look at the data knowledge provisions in the Limitation Act. Susanna will then cover the very important and wide topic of this, of this application under Section 33. Um, so that's the split of labour that we've adopted. So I'll just launch into the first of those subjects, which is uh, when the special regime applies. Uh, we're familiar, I'm sure, with the legislative st structure. Gen generally, uh, under the Limitation Act, claims have to be brought within six years um, in tort and in contract. Um, but we have this special limitation regime for personal injury claims, uh, whereby under Section 11, it's got to be brought within three years of um, the later of the accrual of the cause of action or the claimant state of knowledge. And then th that limitation regime can be disapplied under Section 33. So uh, what is, uh, how is personal injury claim defined in the Act? Um, uh, the, the provision that decides whether the regime applies or not is section 11, subsection 1. It's quoted there um, and uh, you can see the critical words that jump out. First of all, the phrase negligence, nuisance or breach of duty. And then further on down, uh, uh, damages in respect of personal injuries. Um, those are really the critical phrases and also consist of or include those three critical phrases I'm now going to look at. Negligence, nuisance or breach of duty. Well, the first two aren't a problem. Uh, they're the names of particular torts. And so if the, uh, your cause of action is negligence or nuisance, then this regime will apply. And um, breach of duty has caused more problems in the past. Uh, it's now a bit more clear. It now includes, it certainly includes breach of contract. So a case where the, uh, for example, where the employer is in breach of their um, duty of contractual duty of care. Uh, breach of statutory duty, again, perhaps in the employment context, in the cases where you can still sue uh, for breach of statutory duty. Um, and importantly, in the case of uh, cases of abuse and so on, um, in A, A against Hoare in 2008, the House of Lords overruled previous judgments of Stubbings and Webb and, and held that uh, assault and battery that comes within the scope of the term breach of duty. And the position is still uh, not quite certain in terms of other deliberate torts, misfeasance in a public office, deliberate infliction of psychiatric harm, but uh, the reasoning in Hoare, in my view, would equally apply to those other types of tort, although there's no authority for that as yet, as far as I know. So moving on to the words consist of or include, the significance of this is it will apply to mixed claims. Uh, the Azaz and Denton case is quite a good example. This was a case of a gentleman who sued a uh, spiritual guru under whose spell he had come. Uh, his main claim was that he'd signed over his home and all his property to this person, or rather the person's um, 
trust. Um, but he also included within his claim a claim to psychiatric injury. And it was held that therefore that the uh, limitation regime in section 11 applied to the whole claim, including uh, the, uh, the equity type claims for undue influence. Um, the exception to this is that where there is another statutory regime that applies to another type of the claim, um, that uh, this principle won't apply. So, for example, if you mix up your personal injury claim, the defamation claim, uh, you're going to have a one year limitation period on the def defamation claim and uh, the three year for the other type of personal injury claim. Damages in respect to personal injuries. Um, so what do we mean by personal injuries? It's defined partially in the Act, uh, in very wide terms, any disease and any impairment of a person's physical or mental condition. So therefore it will apply uh, to pregnancy cases where somebody uh, has, ha has uh, had uh, contraceptive treatment and that's failed. Uh, Walk-in is the authority for that. It applies to wrongful birth cases. Uh, that, the authority for that is Godfrey. So we're talking there about cases uh, where it's said that the uh, mother would have uh, terminated a pregnancy had she known, for example, about congenital defects. And uh, we're, uh, it also applies to cases of failure to ameliorate congenital conditions such as dyslexia. Uh, many years ago, some of you may remember, there were many, many cases where people sued for local education authorities for failing to deal with um, particular um, learning difficulties, uh, chiefly dyslexia. And the Adams case held that, um, th that those cases fall within the person injuries regime for limitation purposes. Uh, cases that fall outside the regime, uh, first of all, looking at other provisions of the Limitation Act, fatal cases have their own rules. Um, uh, Section 11.5 deals with claims on behalf of the estate. And sections 12 and 13 deal with claims under the Fatal Accidents Act. There's not space for me to deal with those rules. Um, but in broad terms, you get three years from the death, regardless of whether time had already started running before the person's death. So if you get somebody who is ill um, and uh, lingers in hospital for a long time and then dies, uh, there's a three year period uh, from the date of their death, broadly speaking. Protection from Harassment Act. For reasons I've never quite understood, falls outside, uh, is, is taken outside the scope of the three year limitation period. I've never quite understood why. Um, but um, that can be quite significant in stress at work cases because quite often uh, the claimant will be suing under the Protection from Harassment Act as well as in negligence. And a recent case I had, a solicitor got very excited about limitation defence until I had to point out uh, that in fact all the acts were within the previous six years and therefore, although they were out of time in negligence, uh, they can still sue under the Harrison Act. Um, defective products under the Consumer Protection Act have their own regime, um, as does, um, I only discovered this yesterday actually, uh, a claim against insurer under something called the Automated Electric Vehicles Act. So if you get run over by Elon Musk, um, that, uh, that, that will be the actual suing under, and that has its own limitation regime. And other statutory provisions can also have their own limitation regimes. The Human Rights Act, of course, one year, which can be extended. Um, the Equality Act, six months, which can be extended. Uh, and then uh, because our, our colleague Sarah Prager gets very upset if travel law is not mentioned during every single webinar we do, I'm going to mention this, the special rules that arise under the various international conventions regarding travel. Um, and there's the Montreal Convention, uh, there's the Convention of International Carriage by Rail, and there's the Athens Convention. Those all have their own limitation periods, and Sarah will get very, very cross if you miss them. I think it's two years for Montreal and Athens. Uh, carriage by Rail, um, not quite sure. And Sarah's just typed in the chat, as you can see, these are very important rules in capital letters. I think she's um, a bit uh, jaundiced about the number of times those uh, rules have been overlooked. So there you are, no excuse now. So then moving on to how time runs under the Act, uh, what's the start of the period? Section 11 again provides for this and subsection 3 uh, and, and 4 deal with this. Uh, and uh, subsection 4 is the important thing, it's three years from the later of these two dates. First of all, the date on which the cause of action accrued. Uh, and secondly, the date of knowledge, if later, of the person injured. 
So it's the nature of those two dates. So what do we mean by the date of, on which cause of action accrued? Um, well, time starts to run when all the constituent parts of a cause of action are present. Now, with some causes of action, they do not require a claimant to identify any particular damage, and breach of contract is one, uh, and trespass to the person is perhaps the other main one. If you are assaulted, it doesn't matter if you're injured or, or not. Um, and uh, so you can just sue for the um, upset and humiliation and so on inherent on being assaulted. But obviously others do require the presence of damage, negligence, uh, and breach of statute duty being the main ones. You have to actually show some actual damage that's been caused. And, and until such actual damage has been caused, you're not going to have a complete cause of action. So what do we need, mean by relevant damage? Um, the authority, leave authority cartilage from 1963, um, any damage which is more than minimal is sufficient and importantly they decided the knowledge of the claimant was irrelevant. Now it's important to understand the history. At that time um, there were no date of knowledge provisions in the limitation uh, law. So uh, you've got a very unjust situation in cases like that which is a case of industrial disease whereby the exposure to the offensive uh, dust or whatever it was or agent uh, was causing damage to the claimant's body and the claimant was, would be quite unaware of that and yet because uh, that damage was ongoing said the house of lords um, that was sufficient to start time running against the claimant and so the claim would be time barred before the claimant even knew they had uh, uh, something to sue for obviously a very unfair situation that's why the date of knowledge provisions were brought in uh, another in, another important point is this very often of course we have accidents or incidents where people sustain more than one injury. If you, um, if, you, if you suffer successive types of distinct injury, as is common uh, with cases involving um, industrial disease, particularly asbestos exposure, um, then the fact that you uh, subsequently go on to sustain a second injury, a distinct type of disease, uh, does not in fact create a new cause of action. Uh, Lloyd is a good example of this. This claimant, first of all, got asbestosis from his asbestos exposure. He actually brought a claim against two former employees in respect of that exposure. And then later on, unfortunately, he went on to develop mesothelioma. Um, the time it was held began to run on the first damage to his lungs. The fact that there was later, he later got cancer uh, in the form of mesothelioma uh, wasn't relevant and didn't create a new cause of action, albeit that the judge did uh, extend time under section 33 in that case. Uh, postponing of the running of time, this is obviously very important. If you're under a disability, uh, time does not commence running until, you, until the disability ceases. By disability, we're not talking in general terms about somebody who has day-to-day -day difficulties. It has a specific definition. Uh, first of all, um, in relation to children, time will not start to run until they're 18, and therefore the period won't expire until they're 21 at the earliest. And then secondly, people who lack capacity to litigate. This can create more problems uh, for people. Um, first of all, uh, time will never start to run until capacity is actually regained. Uh, but, but once uh, capacity has been regained, it will continue to run even if someone subsequently loses capacity. And there are a number of cases, of course, of people who have severe head injuries, for example, where time can never start to run. The Headford case is a particularly dramatic example of that, uh, so, uh, where the claimant sued 28 years after they were born uh, for events at the time of their birth. And there was absolutely nothing the defendant could do uh, in relation to resisting that claim uh, because all the doctors had passed on and there were no records. Uh, and, uh, they, uh, and it was impossible to contest the claim, but they had no limitation defence. Uh, just also to mention, there's also provisions relating to fraud, concealment and mistake in section 32. They're not often relevant in relation to personal injury claims, so I draw your attention to the existence of that provision, uh, but it's not very often you'll have to uh, rely on it. Um, moratoriums by agreement. These are very important points of practice uh, because very often, uh, parties will find uh, that it's necessary to agree that the limitation period shouldn't apply at a particular time. 
Uh, that can happen where uh, you want to avoid the need for the claimant to have to issue proceedings where settlement seems to be imminent uh, to enable the protocol to be complied with before the proceedings start and also to enable uh, one or other party an appropriate chance to obtain some evidence. Um, the idea is um, that the defendant won't be able to rely on the period for which the agreement is in place. But there are traps for both parties here which need to be uh, avoided and uh, uh, they come up very often in practice. Uh, the trap for the claimant uh, is to assume that the limitation period is being extended merely because there are negotiations ongoing. That is a mistake you must avoid. Um, it's very important that you obtain express written agreement from the defendant uh, to the extension of the limitation period. Um, sometimes you may be able to rely on estoppel, which is very difficult to prove. The DNS case is an example of that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, as a matter of practice, you need to make sure well in advance of the expiry of the period that you have an appropriate written agreement in place. The trap for the defendant is this. Um, it may well be that you are prepared to allow um, some additional uh, time uh, to uh, the claimant to get their act in order, but you already have a limitation defence which you want to preserve. Therefore, you have to be very careful with the way you frame uh, the agreement with the claimant. Uh, so just one example from my recent practice. Um, we had a sex abuse claim that was brought 25 years after the event on the face in circumstances which can give quite a strong limitation defence. However, in response to the uh, claimant's request for, um, a, quote, a waiver of the limitation period, the insurer said, well, limitation is not an issue. And the master of the Queen's Bench Division held that that was sufficient to waive entitlement to rely on the previous 25 years, as well as the previous, as the, the further six months that they lacked before proceedings were issued. So the limitation defence was held uh, to have been lost altogether. So as a defendant, you need to make absolutely clear uh, that the agreement reserves uh, the defendant's rights as to the period before the agreement takes effect. All that said, these are useful devices, with the use of which should be encouraged uh, to keep costs down and to make the process of negotiation and settlement easier, but care is needed. So uh, the bringing of the claim, um, what, what, what event is it that brings the period to an end? Well, CPR 7.2 says, proceedings are started when the claim forms issued, uh, and it's issued on the date entered on the form by the court. Somewhat um, inconsistently, however, the practice direction 7a uh, contains this. Where the court claim form is issued was received by the court officer's date earlier, the claims brought for the purposes of the Limitation Act on that earlier date. It's not infrequently the case, particularly these days, with um, such overwhelmed administration in the court officers, of course, that it takes some time to issue a claim. So uh, you're going to have to look at the notice of issue as well as the claim form in order to be sure uh, what the relevant date is. Rules for calculating the period, you ignore the date of injury, but you take into account the date on which the claim is brought. Part days are ignored. Um, so if you're injured on August the 20th, 2017 at 2 p.m., your claim's in time if it was brought, and that should be obviously 2020 rather than 2017, my apologies. If your claim is brought by midnight on August the 20th, 2020, that should be, uh, it will be in time. Uh, and then there's the rule uh, from Pretam Cow, which I think is still good law. If the court office is closed on the last day, um, then it will be in time if it's issued on the next day. So in other words, if, you're, if August the 20th, 2020 happened to be a Saturday, I don't know whether it is or not, uh, then August the 22nd would be the last day, which is the Monday. Uh, that would be the last day for issue. So uh, we come on then to date of knowledge. And uh, the first, I've called this four factors of an irrelevancy, which sounds like the worst Hugh Grant film you ever went to see. Um, and uh, the, the four factors are set out in section 14 uh, in the following terms. Date of knowledge, you have to have knowledge of four facts. Number one, the injury was significant. Number two, the injury was attributable 
to the act or omission which is alleged to constitute the breach of duty. Number three, who the defendant is. And, third, and, and fourthly, if it's alleged that um, the act or omission was of someone other than the defendant, the identity of the person and the additional facts supporting the bringing of an action against the defendant. And then at uh, the end of the uh, subsection says this, any knowledge that uh, acts or omissions did or did not as a matter of law involve a breach of duty is irrelevant. So they don't have to know uh, that it actually amounts to a cause of action. We'll come back to the significance of that. What do we mean by knowledge? Um, well, the leading case uh, is Ministry of Defence against AB in the Supreme Court. It's a very, very dense and difficult judgment to follow. It's a 4-3 decision arising out of uh, claims brought uh, 50 years after the event by those who were exposed to radiation during nuclear tests in the Pacific in the 50s. Uh, Lord Wilson gives the main judgment for the majority. And the threshold for knowledge is when the claimant came to reasonably believe in them. He does not require evidence to support the belief. If you have a firm belief in facts, that amounts to knowledge for the purposes of the act. And uh, a, a, a good threshold is um, that if the claimant has sufficient confidence uh, to instruct a solicitor to submit a claim to the proposed defendant and start the preparation of the case, that's a good threshold uh, test. Um, you don't necessarily have knowledge when you first consult an expert. Uh, the expert may help you in acquiring that knowledge as well as providing evidence. Of course, the expert may also mislead you. We are familiar, of course, with clinical negligence cases uh, where experts can give an opinion uh, which is contrary to one you get later. And that can often prevent you acquiring knowledge until you know the true position. Constructive knowledge is an important provision in section 43. Obviously, if you shut your eyes to the obvious, uh, you're going to be treated um, as having such knowledge. Knowledge you might reasonably be expected to require from facts observable and ascertainable by him. So the claimant is expected to uh, keep their eye open, as it were, and facts ascertainable by him with the help of medical or other appropriate expert advice, which is reasonable for him to seek. And uh, it's, uh, you won't be fixed with uh, knowledge under this subsection if you've taken reasonable steps to obtain an act on that advice. And that obviously deals with the situation, for example, where your expert leads you on the wrong path. Um, in terms of the, uh, how you apply this test, Adams also assists with this. Um, if, uh, if you're uh, suffering from some kind of injury, you're expected to display some curiosity about it. The test is objective, so uh, or, or almost entirely objective, so it doesn't depend on your personal characteristics about how curious you are. Uh, but if the injury itself would inhibit you from taking advice, that must be taken, taken into account, which is perhaps a retreat somewhat from a purely objective test. So let's look at these criteria briefly. Uh, the significance of the injury, first of all. Uh, this is further elucidated in section 14.2. Significant if the person would reasonably have considered it sufficiently serious to justify his instituting proceedings of damages against a defendant who did not dispute liability and was able to satisfy judgment. So in other words, if you've got a defendant who's putting your hands up, would you bother to sue them or not? Um, again, the same rule about two injuries. If uh, as soon as you know one of them is significant, time will start to run. That's Bristow and Grab. And um, again, the test is objective under this particular provision. That was held, held to be the case in Catholic care, which was heard with the Hall case I mentioned earlier. Lord Hoffman said it was an entirely impersonal standard. And there's a useful summary there of the exercise um, of the, that you're, you're engaged in. The effect of the claimant's injuries and what he could reasonably expect to do is irrelevant. So in the cases where uh, somebody buries the knowledge of the abuse that they suffered, uh, that's not relevant at this stage, though it will, of course, be highly relevant under Section 33. Abuse cases, um, very common scenario, the claimant may be conditioned by grooming to submit to abuse and may suffer a severe psychiatric reaction many years later, perhaps when they disclose or something happens to trigger their memories. 
Stubbings and Webb it was said um, that, uh, that uh, there may be a distinction between different types of abuse. Uh, rape on the one hand clearly amounts to a significant injury, but it may be more equivocal where you've got lesser forms of assault. Um, moving on to attributability, um, the Spargo case is probably the leading case on this. Ironically, uh, Lord Justice Brooke said just before this passage, uh, there's far too, many, far too much case law on this provision, and now everybody cites what he went on to say about Section 14.1b. Um, so what you need to know, it, this is in terms of uh, the link between uh, the Act and the, um, uh, the negligence and the injury. A broad knowledge of the essence of it. Uh, you don't need, therefore, a detailed medical understanding of the process uh, that, that's led to your injury. You just need to have, say, right, I went into hospital, I had an operation, now I can't move my shoulder properly, something's gone wrong, something like that. Uh, it must be a real possibility capable of being attributed to. And um, you've got the knowledge when you know it's enough to reasonable to be begin to investigate. That's really the same point as, as was being made in the uh, Ministry of Defence case I mentioned earlier. And uh, the fourth point, um, the barking up the wrong tree point, if you're misled by an expert or misled by the defendant deliberately or inadvertently, uh, or if you've only got some very vague or general knowledge about what's happened, um, or if um, you're not sure about it and you need expert advice. Uh, although you obviously you are expected to uh, obtain expert advice promptly. Uh, the distinction between law and fact is important here. Uh, you have to draw a distinction between the facts which give rise to the blame and the fact that the defendants to blame in law. The former is relevant and the latter is not. So take a clinical negligence case, for example, where you have ongoing symptoms following an operation. The claimant needs to know that the symptoms are attributable to something going on during the operation. What the claimant need not know is that the uh, surgeon failed to act in accordance with a reasonable body of surgical opinion, uh, which is the legal test, of course, for liability in clinical negligence. So that's the distinction. Uh, it's not often difficult, a difficult one to blame, but there are difficult cases where it can arise. Industrial disease is obviously a, a, a type of case where this arises with a particular acuity. Um, the question usually turns on the link between the exposure uh, to the agent and the, and the onset of the disease. Uh, very often defendants will argue that the claimant knew they were exposed to the agent and they knew they had the disease, therefore they've got their knowledge. That's not enough. They have to be aware of the link. So you have to look very carefully at the claimant's medical records. When was the cause of the claimant's illness first recognised by the doctors and made known to the claimant? And also what the general knowledge is in the industry. You need to take account, of course, is that workers very frequently had very much less knowledge uh, than their employees, employers rather, um, about uh, what the position was in relation to disease. And then finally, there's the identity of the defendant. This doesn't often cause problems, uh, but sometimes uh, claimants are misled. Cressy is an interesting example. Uh, the claimant was, it was it turned out, employed by Company A within the group, but Company B's name in the same group appeared on the payslips. Um, there was an attempt by the claimant's sisters to clarify in correspondence, but the group's insurers uh, failed to clarify it. Uh, and it was held, therefore, that time did not start to run until it became known to the claimant exactly who his employer was. Uh, and this was said, however, uh, that usually this ought, this ought to be capable of being sorted out. So you're only probably going to be able to rely on this principle um, in the event that uh, you, you're actually being misled inadvertently or deliberately by the uh, defendant or its insurers um, as to the true identity of the defendant. Uh, or, or in a case, for example, where you're struggling to trace somebody who may be vicariously liable uh, for the uh, actions of the uh, talk visa. That is, um, that's me. Um, so I'm now going to stop and I shall hand over to Susanna to deal with section 33. Thank you, Paul. That was a very interesting and informative talk, which I'm sure reminds us all of the key principles applying to the primary limitation period. Um, let me just find 
Right, so you should all be able to see my screen, hopefully. Um, I'm going to be talking about Section 33 of the Limitation Act. Um, this, of course, is the court's discretion to extend time for any period beyond um, the three-year period which is given in the legislation which Paul's gone through. It's obviously a very familiar provision to us personal injury practitioners, um, but it can also be quite a tricky one to apply in practice. It's very open-ended, and I'm sure all of us who practice personal injury have at one point or another sat and scratched our heads and wondered what we should advise when looking at a particular set of facts and thinking about how the court should be expected to exercise its discretion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the leading case on this provision, which is there is helpfully one particular leading case. Um, and then I'm going to go through some recent cases and think about what we can learn from them, because this is a very fact based exercise. Um, so turning to the provision itself, this is the first part of Section 33. Um, it applies to claims which fall under Section 11, Section 11A and Section 12. So that's personal injury claims, Fatal Accident Act claims and claims under the Consumer Protection Act. I will be focusing just on personal injury claims here. Um, as I'm sure Sarah would like me to remind you all, it doesn't apply to claims under the Montreal Convention or the Athens Convention or any of those travel law conventions. Um, where it's a completely non-extendable period. Um, the provision has applied in some form since 1975, so going on about 45 years. It's relatively unusual in that there aren't many provisions which allow a court a discretion to disapply the limitation period. The main area where there's a similar provision is the Defamation Act. Um, now, looking at section 33.1, what we can see here is that it depends on whether a court regards it as equitable. Um, and we can also see from the bottom of that provision that the court may direct. So this is technically a true discretion. However, what the case law says, um, and in particular the case of Murray and Devonish, is that what we're talking about here is really just a nominal discretion. So um, if the court considers that on the fact this is equitable, it's not going to decide not to exercise its discretion, if that makes sense. Um, once it's found that it is equitable, it kind of has to really allow the period to be extended. Now, the crucial part of section 33 is um, subparagraph three, this is where we have all the key factors um, in terms of deciding whether the period should be extended. Crucially, it's a non-exhaustive list and the, the beginning says the court should have regard to all the circumstances of the case. So in effect, all facts are relevant for this um, discretion. Subparagraphs A and B, if we look at those, are about the delay and the extent to which that's affected the parties. So that's really about whether the claimant or the defendant are prejudiced um, by the delay or for the claimant prejudiced if the judge doesn't exercise the discretion, which means their claim can't go further. Um, then if we look on, you'll see that subparagraphs C, E and F are really about the party's conduct. So, for example, whether the defendant has acted reasonably, whether the claimant has acted promptly and reasonably, um, and what steps the claimant has taken. And then subparagraph D is about disability, which, as Paul said, is a, is a technical legal term that they don't have capacity in law to bring a claim. Um, so this would apply where they did have capacity when the cause of action accrued, so time began to run, um, and then they, became, they fell under a disability at some point. Um, Lord Diplock, in the Court of Appeal case of Thompson and Brown, described this list as a curious hodgepodge, and I think he was right to call it that. 
the factors don't fit terribly well together. There's no sense of which is to be treated as the most important. Um, so it's not necessarily the easiest provision to apply. Um, Horton and Sadler has set out the, the House of Lords findings that this is indeed a wide and unfettered discretion. And very helpfully, we do now have a leading case, namely Carroll and Chief Constable, where the Court of Appeals set out its really its definitive account of how we should apply Section 33. Um, it was an employer's liability claim. I'm not going to go into the facts of it, but crucially, it's paragraph 42 that you need to read. This has 13 paragraphs which deal with different elements of the discretion. They're all very important, and I would really urge you, whenever you face something, a provision like this, to go to, to paragraph 42 and just read it, because currently it is still the leading case. And all those paragraphs are very helpful. I'm going to quote just a couple of the main paragraphs. Um, so this is sort of paragraph three within paragraph 42. The essence of the proper exercise of the discretion is it's a balance of prejudice. The burden is on the claimant to show that his or her prejudice would outweigh that to the defendant. But although this is a burden on the claimant, it's not necessarily a heavy burden. And of course, if the discretion isn't exercised, the claimant themselves suffers a prejudice. Prospects of a fair trial are very important. Um, the very purpose of the Limitation Act is to prevent defendants being faced with stale claims and so you have to consider carefully what evidence does the defendant have and what evidence would they have if the claim had been issued in time. The reason for the delay is also very important. If there's a good reason then it may well be fair and just for the action to proceed. Um, if there's not a good reason that may well tip the balance in the other direction. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider and I've, I've put this, I've sort of made it into four basic questions which I think if you ask yourself these questions you should have a relatively good understanding of whether the court is or is not likely to allow the exercise of discretion. So my first question is, has the delay after the expiry of the limitation period significantly diminished the defendant's ability to defend the claim? And that's, that's the really crucial question. So for example, have witnesses died? Have witnesses, are there witnesses that the defendant just can't get in touch with? Are there documents which have been lost? Is this basically just gonna be the claimant's evidence which the defendant can't really counter except to talk about whether the claimant's a reliable witness? That's crucially important. If the defendant still has relevant witnesses and still has documentation, that will really um, swing the balance towards exercising the discretion. Um, what is the claimant's reason for the delay? So obviously this is the sort of place where you consider, have they been under a disability during the period um, of delay? That's obviously a pretty solid reason. Equally, if they've been in poor health, but not under a, um, a disability, that's also potentially a good reason. Have they been given poor legal advice by their lawyers? Again, interestingly, that may be excusable, even though that would suggest they might then have a claim against their lawyers. But I, the judge is often reluctant to blame the claimant for them sensibly following advice to say that you know they don't need to issue it immediately. So that's question two. Question three is, is a factor which actually doesn't appear among the six factors in section 33, but in the case law it's shown to be very important and this is when was the defendant first notified. So if they were first notified not long after the accident happened and they subsequently destroyed all their records, um, the judge will not be very impressed by that. Um, equally, if there's been a 30-year delay and only then does the claimant say, actually, this terrible thing happened to me, and that's the first the defendant hears of it, 
that doesn't look so good for the claimant. And finally, my question four is considerations of proportionality. So all sorts of questions arise under this, but is the claim very low value? Is it a very weak claim? Is there actually a very good case against the claimant's solicitors? These are all the sorts of things the court will consider because to try a claim which relates to things which have happened many years ago is something which the court generally wants to avoid. And so if it's a very weak claim or a very low value claim, etc., these are all things going against the claimant in terms of exercising that. So those are the four questions which I um, suggest are especially relevant, but I would really encourage you all to read paragraph 42 because it really does summarise all the main points. Um, it's incredibly helpful and it also takes you to all the cases where those points have been made. Um, a further point I should make, when we're talking about a period of delay, it's largely the delay after the expiry of the limitation period and um, the courts have said that the first two factors under section 33.3 relate to the delay after the expiry of the period. However, it is relevant to consider the entire period of delay. So the period from the accrual of the cause of action to when the claim was brought. For example, in some occupational health claims, there'll be a very, very late date of knowledge. Um, and you might have, say, 30 years between the accrual of the cause of action and the date of knowledge. And the court is willing to take that entire period into account in saying, as soon as the claimant found out, they should have done something about it. Um, that's dealt with in cases like Collins and Secretary of State for Business um, and Donovan and Gwentoy. So what's most relevant is the delay after expiry, but the court can take it all into account to a lesser degree. What I'm going to do now is go through um, a number of cases where these have been applied and I think it's helpful to sort of think about how the courts have, have applied these to certain sets of facts um, and hopefully that will help us in sort of deciding, giving that advice on a tricky limitation point um, when it arises. Um, so I've, I've selected pretty recent cases just to sort of, you know, have the cutting edge of, of judicial decisions. There are so many cases out there where courts have considered this, so I've just tried to select a, an interesting few. Um, car and panel products is a case where the claimant was employed to operate woodworking machinery um, with the defendant company between 1974 and 1981, um, so rather a long time ago for a claim brought in around, um, well, issued in 2013. He suffered noise-induced hearing loss, um, and he said that was because of the defendant's negligence and breach of duty. In 1981, when he stopped working there, the defendant company went into liquidation. Machines by 2013, when he issued this claim, had all gone. There were no witnesses available. In effect, the defendant had absolutely no evidence in relation to the claim. The court found that his date of knowledge was actually all the way later in 2008, so a good 20 something years after the cause of action had accrued. And he issued in 2013, so he was only two years late in terms of when he issued. So it was a tricky one because most of the documents, or in fact all of the documents which had been lost, had been lost before the expiry of the limitation period um, and not during the two years after it. However, the court felt that it was not right for the discretion to be exercised in this case. It was a low value case, it was only worth £7,000. It would have to depend entirely on the claimant's own evidence. There was no good reason for the two years of lateness and so the court decided not to exercise the discretion. Um, Ellison Heart of England is a clinical negligence case where the claimant claimed to have received negligent medical treatment in February and March 2013. He wanted to bring claims against three defendants, which were two NHS trusts and a GP. 
His claim was, in effect, there'd been various delays in his treatment and he'd been left with epilepsy and permanent left-sided weakness, so relatively serious injuries. He actually wrote a letter of claim before the expiry of the limitation period and he agreed with the third defendant that there would be a three-month extension to the limitation period. He then contacted the third defendant again and said he wasn't going to pursue a claim against him. I should say the third defendant was the GP. And what happened was the claimant then changed his mind and seven months after the end of the agreed extension, he decided he did want to sue the third defendant and the third defendant opposed this. And what the judge found was that the defendant was in no worse a position evidentially than the third defendant had been in before. The defendant had been notified very early on of this claim and it was a short period of delay, so the, the discretion should be exercised. Bernard and Haynes is another employer's liability case. He was employed as a roofer um, between 1959 and 1971 to two. His date of knowledge was 2008 and he issued the claim in 2017. So six years late. Um, there are a few reasons for this delay. Up until 2014, the claimant solicitors tried um, the claimant solicitors tried to find the insurers for the defendant. The defendant had gone insolvent by this point and they simply weren't able to find any insurer. And then they eventually, some details were uploaded and they managed to, to locate the relevant insurer. However, between 2014 and 2017, the claimant solicitors were very slow and failed to issue until 2017. The def this is another case where the defendant had lost most of its evidence long before the expiry of the limitation period, um, so had very little to say to oppose the claimant's claim. The first instance judge felt the entire period of delay was culpable and refused an extension of the limitation period. The High Court overturned this and said the first three years, so when the claimant solicitors were looking for the insurer, were not culpable. It was the period after that that was culpable. Um, and the court made some quite interesting comments about the effect where a lot of the evidence has been lost before the expiry of the limitation period, how the court should approach that. And it said, on the one hand, the culpable period made no difference to the defendant. But on the other hand, the claimant shouldn't be able to delay for no good reason, simply because the defendants already lost all of their evidence. Um, and it will come to a point where because of the claimant's failure to issue, um, the court shouldn't extend it. And the court really felt this was sort of on the borderline of those two. And ultimately it felt it was only a three year period of culpable delay. This was really the claimant's solicitor's fault and not the claimant's and so allowed the discretion. EXE and governors of uh, Royal Navy School um, this is one of quite a few sex abuse cases which are very common so whether sex abuse people often don't think of issuing a claim until many many years after for a whole host of reasons often to do with shame and embarrassment um, and after the Jimmy Savile scandal a lot more of these claims sort of came out of the woodwork so in this case the claimant had a sexual relationship in 1991 um, when he was 14 with a kitchen porter employed by the defendant and the kitchen porter was actually convicted for having a sexual sexual intercourse with her sorry it was a woman um, he was convicted of having sexual intercourse with her on a number of occasions she then issued a claim in 2017 so there was an 18 year period of delay she alleged that in fact she'd been raped and she also claimed that there was another occasion when she'd been raped and it was somewhat different on the facts to what he'd been convicted of, which was only sexual intercourse with a minor. Um, at trial, her evidence was obviously cross-examined. It was found not to be credible. Her allegations, which she made, were very different to what she'd said in a police statement at the time. 
there were a number of points she couldn't remember at all. There were a number of issues where she was obviously wrong. Um, and the kitchen porter who was responsible couldn't be located by the defendant. Um, the judge accepted that she hadn't issued because she felt ashamed and she had anxiety, although she wasn't disabled for the purpose of bringing a claim. However, it was felt there was very little evidence of what had actually gone on and that there, that there was significant prejudice to both sides caused by the loss of evidence and that the discretion shouldn't be exercised. Um, FX Evan Ampleforth, the claimant claimed to have been assaulted by a priest as a young child in 1968 to 9. Um, she issued 32 years after the expiry of the limitation period. The priest had by this point died and so the defendant had very little evidence. It was accepted that she had experienced shame up until around 2013 and so she didn't want to bring a claim. At trial, her memory was found to be very limited. There were no contemporaneous records. There were lots of inconsistencies in her evidence and there was simply very little evidence of what had happened. And so it was felt there couldn't be a fair trial and the discretion shouldn't be exercised. And the final case, Haringey LBC and FZO, another sex abuse case where a teacher at the defendant's school had a sexual relationship with a claimant. He was convicted for that. Um, but the claimant claimed damages in respect of an ongoing relationship he had had with the teacher after that school. And he said that this relationship was abusive. The claim was brought um, 25 to 30 years after the expiry of the limitation period. He had stayed in touch with the defendant, sorry, with the teacher for a very long time. In 2011, he had a mental breakdown. And before this point, he hadn't seen the relationship as being abusive. But the judge accepted that the delay was because of grooming and emotional manipulation of the claimant. Here, most of the evidence was effectively those two individuals, the teacher and the claimant. Both of them were able to give evidence at the trial. The judge didn't feel that a huge amount of evidence had been lost. Um, and she also found that, um, yeah, basically just that the, the evidence was still largely there. The experts were still able to deal with causation and so the discretion should be exercised. Um, so those are all examples of cases where this discretion has been decided one way or another. I hope it gives some idea of what you can expect in these sorts of cases. As I said, I think if you go through those four questions which I outlined earlier, that is a very helpful um, starting point of, on how to advise in these sorts of matters. I'm finally just going to consider briefly appeals. Um, these decisions are generally pretty difficult to appeal on because they're so fact focused. It's really important to focus on the substance of the decision. McComb, Lord Justice McComb in Car and Panel Products gave a very useful analogy of distinguishing between a shaky brick and an unsound foundation stone. If there's just a shaky brick in terms of how the first instance judge has expressed his decision, that's fine and the judge can look beyond that. If it's an unsound foundation stone, such as misunderstanding section 33 and how all factors are relevant or something like that, then the court will have to re-exercise the discretion. And Mrs Justice Yip in HMG3 and Dunn also endorsed this approach and she said you have to be realistic about what is to be expected from county court judges um, giving extemporary judgments and you have to look at the bigger picture and draw inferences where necessary. Um, that's everything from me. Thanks so much for listening. Um, Paul, I'm going to hand back to you, if I may. Thank you, Susanna, for that very clear uh, talk. We very much hope that everyone's found these, uh, these talks to be useful. A couple of questions uh, that we've had, uh, which we'll just draw your attention to. Uh, first of all, uh, we had one from Rianne Griffith. Thank you for that, Rianne. 
who asked this, what wording would you suggest the defendant to use in responding to a claimant when it's prepared to agree a limitation extension uh, but wants to retain a limitation defence it already has? Susanna's response was um, that the defendant agrees that in any subsequent issue about limitation we will not rely upon any period of time that elapses between the date of this correspondence and X date, whatever date you want the moratorium to determine on. That will do fine. Um, I would just add words to the effect of, for the avoidance of doubt, the defendant reserves the right to rely on any limitation defence accrued up to the date of this correspondence. Um, and then the second question we had was from Charlotte Pritchard. Um, she asked this, when a claimant's died during the duration of the claim in accordance with the Limitation Act, Limitation will, be, will then be three years from the date of death, provided limitation hadn't expired when the claimant was alive. That's correct. That's what the effect of um, sections 11, 5, 12 and 13. Uh, does it make any difference, she says, if a limitation moratorium was agreed whilst the claimant was alive? Um, I think that's, I, I think it will. Uh, and I've given a practical example in my answer to Charlotte. Uh, if you take, for example, someone who acquired date of knowledge, a disease case where someone acquired date of knowledge on June uh, 1st, 2012, there was a moratorium agreed March 15 for six months, which would have lasted till September 15, but the claimant died in August 15. Uh, my view would be that because the defendant had waived the right to, to rely on limitation between March and August, it was still open to the claimant to bring a claim on the date of death uh, so that there was until August 1918, uh, 2018 rather, uh, to bring uh, the claim under the Fatal Accidents Act and the Law Reform Act. Uh, I hope that answers Charlotte's question. Thank you very much for that, Charlotte. We hope very much that you've um, you found this um, webinar useful. Um, next week uh, we have, what do we have, Sarah, uh, Susanna, just remind me. Just, uh, just unmute yourself, please. Um, we have Connor and Sarah Prager talking about foreign uh, foreign road traffic accidents. That was actually on my PowerPoint, but I didn't um, get around to it, getting to it. So please do tune in uh, to listen to uh, to, to listen to uh, Sarah, and no doubt get further lectures about missing the limitation periods under the conventions. Um, and uh, we thank you very much indeed for listening today. And as I've said, slides will be made available on our website, and you'll be able to watch. This presentation, we hope, on YouTube in due course, uh, should you wish uh, an easy cure of insomnia. Thanks very much indeed, everybody.